بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم بك أمسينا وبك أصبحنا وبك نحيا وبك نموت وإليك المصير أمسينا وأمس الملك لله رب العالمين رب نسألك خير هذه الليلة فتحها ونصرها ونورها وبركتها وهداها ونعوذ بك من شر ما فيها وشر ما بعدها We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this gathering and to accept from us to forgive our sins and to elevate our ranks and to make us and our loved ones amongst the people of Jannah Say Ameen, Ameen. If all we get from tonight, if the only thing we take from tonight is that we were in this gathering in which we remembered Allah and asked Him for Jannah, I believe this would be sufficient. And we will mention the hadith of the Prophet wasallam highlighting this point. As we begin with the topic of Jannah, it's extremely important that every one of us recognizes that we need to take time in life to focus on and to study what we believe in our hearts is our final destination. I want to give you an example. Imagine you go to the airport and you walk up to the counter and they ask you, Sir, ma'am, where are you traveling to today? And you say, I have no idea. They ask, where's your final destination? And you say, I don't know. You can't fly, you need to know where you're going. Where are you traveling to? When we embark on this journey of life, this one life that every one of us has before we are resurrected for eternity, we need to know our final destination. We need to know the path to reach that destination. We need to know what kinds of people will help us reach that destination and what kinds of people will take us astray. When you embark on a journey, you need to know what kind of fuel or sustenance do you need so that you will survive until you reach that destination. We need to know what kinds of roadblocks or detours might arise and how to get back on track when you get off the track. This one journey of life, all human beings, regardless of religion, race, ethnicity, language, age, gender, does not matter. Every single human being can agree upon one principle and that is that the guarantee in this life one of the guarantees of this life is death we will depart and there will be an eternal destination there will be an eternal home and if we say we want Jannah how much of our time do we spend reminding ourselves about that destination working for that destination studying it from the Quran and from the authentic sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Oh Allah, we ask you for Jannah. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-Jannah. Before we dive into the eternal paradise, I want to mention one thing I touched upon very briefly yesterday, and that is the Jannah of this world. The Jannah of this world is not found in the dollar, it's not found in the car, it's not found in the house. The Jannah of this world, the real happiness, the real tranquility, it cannot be purchased because... If you can purchase it, then the rich would have an advantage over the poor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave everyone the same opportunity to attain the Jannah of this life. And there are many examples that we all have of that tranquility, that paradise, that Jannah that we want. I'll give you just one from the scholar that many people know, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, 14th century scholar. As some of you know his history, he was imprisoned many times. And... Perhaps later on in his life, during one of the visits from his student Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, they went to console him, to make him feel better. And he's behind bars multiple times for many years in life. And as they go to console him, they find that he consoles them. This is how, how high his iman was. That you would go to make him feel better and his iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so high, he makes you feel better. So one of the famous quotes that I know many of you have heard before, that's attributed to him. And it was reported from Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah about his teacher, Ibn al-Taymiyyah rahimahullah. The quote where he said, what can my enemies do to me? My Jannah is in my heart. My Jannah and my Bustan, my garden are in my heart. 
And they go with me wherever I am and they never abandon me. If my enemies decide to kill me, then it is martyrdom. It is shahada. And if they banish me from the land, then it is tourism, siyaha. And if they keep me here in prison, then it is an opportunity for seclusion, for i'tikaf, for worship. So he's always seeing the external world around him as a means of getting closer to Allah. There's always a silver lining. There's always a way to accept it. But that garden, the jannah that he has, it's not something your enemy can take away from you. It's not something that the physical world should be able to take away from you. Yes, there are hardships that are physical. But that jannah is in the heart. That's the jannah that we aim for in this life. That's the paradise that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to place in our hearts the tranquility that we seek through connection with the Creator. Verily in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do the hearts find tranquility, peace, ease, happiness. So the jannah of this life before the jannah of the next life. As we dive into the topic of the jannah of the next life, we introduce the concept of Jannah in a very brief way. Paradise, as we know it, is the ultimate form of reward for those who are God conscious. It's prepared by Allah for those who are righteous. Jannah was prepared for those who believe. And it is a manifestation of Allah's mercy. Why? Because Jannah is not a matter of justice. It's a matter of mercy. If Allah dealt with all of us here with justice, we would not make it to Jannah. Jannah is a manifestation of Allah's mercy for us. And it is eternal in reward. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us that. As there are so many things to say about the concept of Jannah, I want to begin with three different ahadith to establish the foundations of what we're discussing here. The first hadith, and these are all authentic. The first hadith is the hadith of Bukhari. Hadith Qudsi in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have prepared for my righteous servants ma la ra'at, what no eye has ever seen, wa la udhunun sami'at, what no ear has ever heard, and what has not been imagined by any heart, it has not been conceived. People tell you and they tell us, your imagination is limitless. And Allah is telling you, no, your imagination is limited. In Jannah, there are things you cannot possibly understand in this life. And if they were described to us, we still would not understand them. This is why when we talk about Jannah, the things that we see in the Quran and Sunnah, these are things we recognize by words alone. The fruits of Jannah, the palaces of Jannah, the rivers of Jannah, the family reunions. These are things we can relate to in this life because we have them in this life, in their own form. But in Jannah, there is much more than that. So everything we have of this world, the descriptions of Jannah that Allah gives us in the Quran in the Sunnah, these are an introduction to Jannah. Because Allah has prepared what you cannot imagine, what you cannot conceive, what you have never seen or heard in this world. The second hadith to introduce the topic, the hadith of Muslim, in which the Prophet wasallam, in the latter half of the hadith, mentions that the most destitute of the people of this world, the person who has gone through the most poverty and hardship and suffering. I want you to imagine someone whose life was a life of constant hardship, constant suffering, more than all of us in this room combined. A person who worked for Jannah and earned Jannah by the mercy of Allah. On the day of judgment, pay attention to this beautiful hadith. This person is dipped one dip into paradise. And then Allah asks, O son of Adam, have you ever experienced any hardship? Have you ever experienced any misery? And the person responds, No, Ya Allah, I have never experienced any hardship. I have never experienced any misery. This person has perhaps 70 or 100 years of memories of hardship and pain. Hardship upon hardship. But because of one dip into Jannah, they say, Ya Allah, I don't have any memories of hardship. I don't remember anything miserable in my life, in my experience. I want you to think about this hadith for a moment. That one dip can erase your entire life's worth of pain. One dip can erase every moment of suffering. What about one minute into Jannah? What about one hour in Jannah? What about a year in paradise? And what about eternity? For the people of Jannah, when they enter Jannah, they never leave. And the rewards never die out, they never fade. You don't become bored in Jannah. 
One time a youth raised his hand in a seminar. We were talking about Jannah and Naw. And he said, won't I get bored in Jannah? Is that not possible? Because the mind in this world conceives of boredom. But in the next life, the quality of enjoyment of Jannah is not the same. This is why, for example, when you're starving and you eat that first bite of food and it's hot and fresh, doesn't it taste really good? I want you to imagine someone who's fasting the month of Ramadan and they're very hungry on that day. And let's say this person's favorite food is pizza. I know that's a weird example. But let's say this person likes pizza. At Maghrib time, everyone in Ramadan knows exactly when Maghrib time is, mashallah. At Maghrib time, this person is hungry. They take that first bite of that slice of pizza. Is it good? Is it great? Is it not that great? No, they love it. It's amazing. That first bite's the best bite. What happens with the second slice? It's still, it's good. Third slice, you're already kind of pushing your limits. Islamic limits. Fourth slice, you're pushing it a lot now. Fifth slice, Allahum Musta'ad. Sixth slice, he's not going to tarawih. <laughs> and then when this person gets full, they say, I, I'll never eat this much again. The next day they fast, Maghrib time comes, they do the same thing again. And we all know because we pray next to each other in tarawih. I want you to think about how each slice of pizza diminished in enjoyment. The more you do of, of, of desire in one time in this world, it, becomes, it starts to diminish in quality. It doesn't last. Whereas in Jannah, it's the opposite. You might enjoy that first bite of fruit and say this is the best thing I've ever had in my existence. And you might take another bite and say this was even better than the last. And another bite was better than the last. And so on and so forth. We cannot conceive of the enjoyment that is eternal. Our minds were created in this world to understand the realms of this world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the highest levels of Jannah. The third hadith, for let's say the youngsters here. I know everyone is young, mashallah. For the youngsters here, how many of you know Pokemon? You know Pokemon, mashallah. I asked who knows Elsa yesterday, you said no. Now, the reason I ask you this is because I was giving a lecture on Jannah. And a young man, especially when that app came out, Pokemon Go, suddenly everyone was outside. Old and young, by the way, it doesn't matter. Everyone was outside playing Pokemon Go. Some people were driving and playing and getting into car accidents. And as people were playing this game, and it was a fad at the time, somebody asked, can I have Pokemon if I make it to Jannah? It's a valid question. It's a valid question. And I gave him a beautiful answer from the Prophet ﷺ, hadith reported by Tirmidhi in which a Bedouin man asked the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, will there be horses in Jannah? And the Prophet ﷺ responded, alayhi salatu wasalam, responded, if you make it to Jannah, Allah will grant you a horse made out of red rubies flying with you wherever you want in Jannah. And when I said this, the kids like, that's a Pokemon. I said, if that's a Pokemon, then they took it from the hadith of a Tirmidhi because the hadith was here more than a thousand years ago. But look at this hadith. Someone heard this response. A horse made out of red rubies flying with you wherever you want in Jannah. So another man said, Ya Rasulullah, will there be camels in Jannah? This man wants camels in Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ did not give him the same response. He gave him a better response. For us, it's much better. He said, if you make it to Jannah, if Allah admits you to paradise, then you will have whatever your heart desires. Is that not enough for us? You will have whatever your heart desires. Yes, you can ask hundreds of questions. Can I have this? Can I have that in Jannah? Work for Jannah. Make it to Jannah. You will be happy in Jannah. There is no doubt. Nobody enters Jannah and they're sad. Nobody enters Jannah and they say, I didn't get what I wanted. You will have beyond your imagination. But we have to work for it. We have to strive for it. And striving for it takes effort. And anything, anything that is worth having is worth putting in the effort for. The merchandise of Allah is valuable. What is the merchandise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Verily that the, the merchandise that you're getting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is paradise. And this hadith is uh, authentic according to a tirmidhi. Well, I want to ask a question. How many gates are there in Jannah? Eight. How do we know this? If you answer a question, I might ask you for a follow-up. If you say eight, how do you know there are eight gates? If you say seven, how do you know there are seven gates, Shaykh? 
Jazakallah khairan. Barakallah fi. So there's an authentic hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alayhi salatu wa sallam, teaches us to make a particular dua after perfecting our wudu. And when you make this dua, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions what? That the one who does so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow them to be called from any of the eight gates of Jannah on the day of judgment. What is the dua after the wudu according to this hadith? Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. This is according to this report. We know there are eight gates to Jannah. Now, what am I getting at here? It's not the number eight. I want you to think about what these gates are named after. What is the gate we know of for fasting Ramadan or fasting? Bab al Rayyan. What, what are these gates named after? There's a bab, there's a gate of Jannah for prayer. There's a gate uh, of Jannah for Hajj. These gates are named after actions in this world. They're not named after aspirations or claims or uh, loose terms of identity. It's not about your lineage, it's not about a degree, it's not about wealth, it's not about your family, your tribe, your ethnicity. No, the gates of Jannah are named after actions in this world. And these are actions that help us to unlock these gates. If you want to unlock the gates of Jannah, work for the gates of Jannah as they are defined. Work for the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded in this world. Udkhulul jannata bima kuntum ta'malun With what you used to do of actions. These actions unlock more of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna rahmatullahi qareebun min al-muhsineen. The mercy of Allah is closer to those who excel in good deeds. Those who exemplify righteous actions. So again, the dua after the wudu is an action item. Who is the first person to enter Jannah? By the way, can one of the brothers make this full screen, please? Who is the first person to enter Jannah? I heard Abu Bakr. Any other answers? Yes. Adam, in interesting answer. Bilal, interesting answer as well. The Prophet ﷺ. How do we know any of these answers? Anyone? So this is based off an authentic hadith. And the hadith mentions, uh, to paraphrase, that on the day of judgment, the Prophet ﷺ will be the first to knock on the gates of Jannah. The angel will respond, who is it? The Prophet ﷺ will respond, Muhammad The angel will respond, I was commanded not to open to anyone before you. Now Abu Bakr who heard this and said, Ya Rasulullah, if only I were next to you to see this, to witness this moment. Look at the humility of Abu Bakr he doesn't even imagine that he would be there at that time with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is his humility radiallahu an. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, but you, O Abu Bakr, will be the first of my ummah to enter after me. Is that not an honor for the status of Abu Bakr radiallahu an? After this, we know that the first of nations, the first of ummah to enter is the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is an honor for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as people are entering Jannah, I want you to imagine. Everyone take a moment now to imagine, envision. As people are entering Jannah, and these gates are opening. These gates, by the way, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alayhi salatu wa sallam, mentions that the distance between the two gate panels of Jannah, when they are open, the distance between them is like 40 years for a fast traveler or rider. Meaning what? 40 years distance from one gate panel to the other. This is beyond our imagination in size. Imagine that moment when people are entering Jannah. May Allah make all of us from amongst them. And as they're entering, the Prophet ﷺ mentions that they are 30 years old. According to one hadith, 33 years old. And they are entering and their hearts are as one. Imagine they're entering Jannah and they're finally meeting people that they've lost in this life. People that they disconnected from. Imagine they're looking around and they see their friends. I remember you. Imagine they see their family. Imagine finding one's parent who passed away before them. May Allah have mercy on them. Imagine meeting with a loved one who passed away before you. And they're looking around, they're reuniting in the best of homes. We have made it. We made it to Jannah. There is no pain after this. There's no test after this. There's no trial after this. We've passed the exam of all exams. The objective of all objectives. What do they hear? The angels come to them. And they say what? Salamun alaykum. Peace be upon you. Tlibutum. You've done well. You did what you were supposed to do. Salamun alaykum bima sabartum. Because of what you were patient with. What you endured. Someone says, I want Jannah. Are you willing to work for Jannah? 
Are you willing to be patient? Patience doesn't mean you're only waiting for calamity to strike. No, there's another form of sabr. Sabr is not just patience. It's endurance. It's strength, willpower. That I'm willing to stand up and to pray on time. It's willpower that we are minorities as Muslims, but we will not hide or compromise our faith. It's willpower that the hijab is an obligation, we will wear the hijab. That the prayer is an obligation, we will pray all the prayers. That this thing is a major sin, I will avoid it. That takes strength and it's not always easy. But when we fall short, we try again. When we fall short, we try again. When we fall short, we turn to Allah, the most merciful, and we try again. When do we stop trying? We never stop trying. When do we give up on tawbah? We never give up on tawbah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not stop forgiving you, so do not stop asking Him for forgiveness. As long as your heart is beating, you have hope. And that door of Jannah, the door of mercy is always there. But don't procrastinate. Don't wait. If you want Jannah, work for Jannah. Salamun alaykum bima sabartum. You endured patience. You were working really hard. It was not easy. And now you're getting the best of homes. You're getting the best of homes. There is no alternative to Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the highest levels of Jannah. What do the people of Jannah say when they enter Jannah? What are their first words? Alhamdulillah. وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي صَدَقَنَا وَعْدَهِ وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي هَدَانَا لِهَذَا وَمَا كُنَّا لِنَهْتَدِيَ لَوْلَا أَنْ هَدَانَ اللَّهِ They say, praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who fulfilled his promise to us. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who guided us, and without him we would not be guided. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي أَذْهَبَ عَنَّا الْحَزَن he removed all of the ailments, all of the hardships, all of the pain, all of the difficulties, and He allowed us to enter Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of the people of hamd and shukr. If you want to unlock the gates of Jannah, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it requires a life of gratitude. To be able to say Alhamdulillah on that day requires us to live by Alhamdulillah today. And Alhamdulillah, gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to use the blessings that He gave us in the best manner possible. Use your eyes only for things that are pleasing to Allah. Use your ears only to listen to things that are pleasing to Allah. Your tongue only to say things that are pleasing to Allah. Your hands, your body, your wealth, your time, your health. Everything that Allah gave you in this world. Gratitude is to use those blessings for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the result of that is Jannah. The result of that is to enter and to say Alhamdulillah that Allah fulfilled His promise to us. The first words of Adam alayhi salam, alhamdulillah. The words of the people of Jannah when they enter Jannah. The dua, the supplication of the people of Jannah when they depart in gatherings. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَاهُمْ أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ In Surah Yunus, that the last of their supplications is praise be to Allah, Lord of all the worlds. Alhamdulillah. How many levels are there in Jannah? Can anyone tell us? How many levels are there in Jannah? If we know. Seven? One hundred? Eight? I feel like we're fundraising. Do we have a nine? Do we have a nine? Seven? Seven and eight. So eight is the gates of Jannah. Seven has nothing to do with this Jannah. The seven heavens refers to something else. The one hundred is one, one of the main opinions based on a hadith of a tirmidhi. However, there's another report that mentions that one hundred levels of Jannah are reserved for the mujahideen. Meaning what? There must be more than a hundred. Aisha radiallahu anha, her opinion was based on the following hadith. That on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell the believers, this is paraphrased, Iqra' wartaqi, recite from the Qur'an and elevate in ranks. For every ayah you recite, you will rise a rank in Jannah. And where you recite the last ayah is where your final abode will be, your final home in Jannah. So the opinion of Aisha radiallahu anha is that the levels of Jannah are equivalent to the number of ayat in the Qur'an. And that the one who memorizes and acts upon, the one who memorizes and acts upon the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has an opportunity, it doesn't guarantee, but it's an opportunity to reach the highest levels of Jannah. But it requires a full life of connecting with the speech of Allah in all of its facets, in understanding, recitation, implementation, sharing, teaching, and so on and so forth, as well as memorizing. So memorizing the Qur'an gives us an incentive to rise ranks in Jannah. This is one of the opinions in the opinion of Aisha radiallahu anha. May Allah grant all of us the highest levels of Jannah. 
How do we get to the highest levels of Jannah? There are examples from many authentic ahadith, such as uh, the descriptions of the shuhada being in the highest levels, the people who serve the orphans, they take care of the orphans, they, they are guardians for the orphans, they sponsor the orphans, those who support and take care of the widows. Most times in society, the widows are overlooked and nobody really pays attention to them. And so the one who's taking care of them in their community, in their society, this is a means for them to reach higher levels of Jannah. And generally speaking, make dua for him. When you ask of Allah, as the Prophet ﷺ said, when you ask of Allah, ask for al-firdaus. Meaning what? Aim for the highest levels. Sometimes people say what? A brother once said, and not a young brother. He said, why do I have to aim for al-firdaus? Like if I get to the lowest level of Jannah, will I be happy? Will you be happy in the lowest level of Jannah? Yes, anyone, anyone, everyone in Jannah will be happy. There is no concern of sadness. But why are you aiming for the lowest level of Jannah? You're going to be there forever. Not five years. You're not going to live on that street for ten years. You're going to live there forever. If somebody right now walked into the masjid, a trillionaire, if they exist, and he said, everybody here, I'm going to buy you one car. You're going to drive one car for the rest of your life. Are you going to choose a nice car or not? Of course. If they tell you choose one mansion, one house, one palace in this world, you're going to live there and your children and their children for the rest of your life. Aren't you going to choose a very nice house? Yes, of course. And that's for a limited time. What about eternity? Don't we want to be close to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Don't we want to be close to the arsh, the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Seeing Allah more frequently than the lowest levels of Jannah? We're going to be there forever. We want to aim for the highest levels. So when you ask of Allah, when you make dua, always ask Allah for al-firdaus. But don't just ask for it. Work for it. From the time we wake up to the moment that we sleep. We work for al-firdaus and we also pray for it. Because what we make dua for, we have to put in the effort for as well. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant all of us the highest levels of Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes many times in the Qur'an the concept of the rivers of Jannah. Jannat in tajri min tahtiha al-anhar. Many times in the Qur'an we hear this. These rivers, and there are many of them, some of the scholars say, and this is one of the reports, and you find this in the descriptions of Jannah in, in the works of Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, that these rivers flow from the highest levels of Jannah throughout paradise, and they come up to the palaces, palaces of the people of Jannah. So anyone who has a home in Jannah will also have access to all the rivers of Jannah. And you can imagine as Allah describes some of these rivers, such as Al-Kawthar, and the four rivers mentioned in Surah Muhammad. What are the four rivers in Surah Muhammad? What are the four different types of rivers found in Surah Muhammad? So from, from milk, from honey, from wine, and from, and pure water. Yes? Can we imagine, can we imagine that at any moment we can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anything in Jannah. You can ask for a river of chocolate if you want, if you like chocolate. If you like some other drink, alhamdulillah, ask for that in Jannah. Can you imagine having access to all these different things beyond our imagination? We say river of chocolate and somebody's like, why will I jump in a river of chocolate or honey? I'll get stuck in the honey. Don't, don't compare it to the understanding of this world. Don't think of it in terms of this world. And I hope nobody will try to jump in honey in this world. That would be problematic and very expensive. There are three springs as well mentioned in the Quran. Does anyone know which springs they are? The springs of Jannah, not the rivers. Sal Sabil. Okay, that's one of three. Tasneem. Not Al Kawthar. Al Kawthar is a river. If we don't get it, we're going to have to put it on hold and come back to it. We're going to get it? MashaAllah. Okay, well, we, we have to get it now because we need to move on. I can't give you a hint. There's only three. So some of the scholars say kafur refers to what? It refers to also salsabi and some say they are separate. Wallahu alam. And taslim is another of the springs of Jannah. When we talk about Jannah, sometimes people try to imagine. Somebody once posted this picture. This is, I believe, a resort somewhere, maybe in Indonesia. I'm not sure where. And there was a caption under it that said, if this is what the creation has prepared for the creation, then we can't imagine what the creator has prepared for the creation. And what's interesting about this, this resort right here, most of the beauty in it is what? It's not even the man-made stuff. It's the fact that it's surrounded by the, the nature, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that people are looking at and they're always in awe of it. 
We cannot imagine what Allah has prepared for us in Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the highest levels of Jannah. The palaces of Jannah, according to many of the hadith, they're made out of gold and silver. We have descriptions of gems, rubies, sapphires, emeralds all around on Jannah, the, the floors of Jannah. You can imagine somebody's walking by. It's not like you're shocked. Oh my God, there are diamonds over here and there are rubies over here. No, you're like, oh, another day in Jannah. Alhamdulillah, you're moving on. It's not something uh, mind-blowing. But for us in this world, we cannot imagine the specifics of how that will feel. How do we have and build more houses in Jannah? More palaces in paradise. One of the two action items is to support or to build a masjid in this world. And we always hear of opportunities to build or contribute to a masajid. The one who does so, Allah will build for them a masjid in Jannah. Or rather a palace in Jannah. This is according to the Prophet ﷺ. The second is the authentic hadith of a tirmidhi in which the Prophet ﷺ mentions whoever prays these 12 rak'ahs will mention what they are. The rawatib. Allah will build for you a palace in Jannah. If Allah is building for you a house in Jannah, it's not going to be a house like you imagine. It's not going to be like if your friend says, hey, I'm going to build you a house as a gift. No, Allah is telling you He will build for your house in Jannah. He is the one who's preparing this for you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are these 12 rak'ahs, the rawatib? The rawatib are the 12 rak'ahs, the sunan, the nawafil, that are linked with, tied to the fara'il, the five prayers. So you have two before fajr. You have four before dhuhr. Two after dhuhr, two after maghrib, and two after isha. Some of the scholars say they are 14 rak'ahs, so you have 4 after dhuhr. Some of them say they are 10 rak'ahs, so you have 2 and two before and after dhuhr. Wallahu alam. These are the rawatib. There are many other nawafil we can pray, and we should be praying as often as we can. The trees of Jannah, imagine walking to your palace and you find a garden of trees. They are planted by what? By subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. La ilaha illallah. Allahu akbar. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. These are the types of dhikr that are the plants of the trees of Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst the people of dhikr. The planting of trees in Jannah, by the way, is one of the easiest action items we can do all the time. A man comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi salatu wa salam, and he says, the rulings of Islam are so many. Teach me something that is very simple that I can do regularly. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, what? Keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah. Keep making dhikr all the time. If you're driving, standing, walking, waiting, all the time, make dhikr. If you're not talking to somebody else, make dhikr. Whenever you can, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many different formats and many different forms. The inhabitants of Jannah, they are described in many different ways. And I only want to focus on one thing that was mentioned uh, in Surah Qaf, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the people of Jannah as coming to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala oft repentant. And this qalb that is munib, it is often returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah as a response tells them what? Udkhuluha bi salam. Enter Jannah in peace. Enter Jannah with serenity, with tranquility. This is the day of eternity. This is the day of forever. You're not going to have an end for your reward. It's not going to be interrupted or cut off. Lahum ma yasha'una fiha wa mazid. They will have whatever they want in Jannah. And with Allah is more. Mazid, we will talk about it shortly, inshallah. In other words, my dear brothers and sisters, our hearts are constantly having to be purified in this world. No matter how many times they harden, no matter how many times you make mistakes, the, the objective is to never give up on returning to Allah. Because we all make mistakes in some way. The objective is to never give up on Allah. To never stop trying. Because between every day or two, if you're always returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely, eventually one of those days will be our last. One of those nights we sleep will be our last. And if before it's 24 hours, 48 hours, you had repented sincerely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least they had not been postponed and procrastinated for weeks or years. A brother one time stops at the masjid and he comes and he prays maghrib with us and suddenly he starts crying really loudly. We find out what? This was a seminar seven years ago on the topic of Jannah and Nar. And we find out this brother had not gone to a masjid in five years. Five years. He used to be a regular praying here in the masjid in a different state. Five years, what happened? Something happened in his life, a hardship, and he decided he was angry at Allah. Instead of being humble, instead of being patient, instead of turning to Allah, making more dua, it's not easy, of course, but it should bring you closer to him. He said, I, I, I felt angry, so I stopped praying in the masjid. And then he said, one day I decided to skip a prayer. That first prayer that he skipped was a huge deal for him. Like he felt really, really bad. And shaitan tried to make him feel normal about it. It became normalized. He said, then I skipped another prayer. 
And usually he said, if I missed a prayer, I would make it up. If I overslept with Fajr and I woke up late, I will still pray Fajr. He said, but after this cycle started of missing a prayer completely, I stopped making them up. Over, over these five years, he said, I stopped praying completely. What happened? How did he come back to the masjid? Why would he go back to the masjid? He said, I urgently, listen to this, I urgently had to use the restroom. And my house is far and the masjid, I, I, I know where the masjid is. I stopped at the masjid and I said, I'm just going to use the bathroom and leave very quickly. He didn't even know it was Maghrib time. He goes inside to the bathroom, he uses the restroom and he, as he's making wudu, or rather as he's washing his hands, somebody's making wudu next to him and it's somebody who recognizes him. He's like, oh brother, where have you been? I haven't seen you in a while, have you moved? He's like, no, I, I haven't moved. And as they're talking, he said, I felt embarrassed, this guy's making wudu and they're making adhan and you can hear the adhan. He said, so I just started making wudu. I wasn't intending to pray, I was waiting for this guy to finish and leave the bathroom, but he wouldn't leave the bathroom. He made wudu and waited for me and talked. Sometimes it pays off. And as they're talking, he's like, I felt awkward. So I finished my wudu and walked with him to the musalla. And I decided at that time, even though my heart kept telling me, leave the masjid, run away, go, leave. He said, you know what? I'm already here. I feel awkward. This guy knows me. People are looking at me. Some, some people came up and said salam to him. And this is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Afshu salam. Spread the, the peace, the greetings to people you know and people you don't. You see someone in the masjid you don't recognize. There's no problem with going to them and saying salam. That actually might save their life. And this is based on stories. I'm not making things up. So that brother, he enters the, the musalla and they call the iqamah and he prays maghrib for the first time in five years. He broke down crying in salah. He broke down crying in salah, listening to these ayat actually from Surah Qaf. And he said, I don't know why. I have no justification for abandoning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for running away from Him. But I'm so grateful that I came back to Him. I'm so grateful He guided me back to Him. Allah is at tawwab at tawwab there's something interesting about it. Why don't we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, simply is, is forgiving? He is oft forgiving, meaning what? The fact that you turned to Him to ask Him for forgiveness was Him allowing you to turn to Him. He was guiding you to turn back to Him in forgiveness so that He would forgive you because Allah wants to forgive. Allah wants to forgive. He does not want to punish. So earn and seek His forgiveness no matter how many times you fall short. Tawbah is a key to Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who are always seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Hellfire has been veiled with desires. And paradise, Jannah has been veiled with hardships. What does this mean? What does this exactly mean? This means, as Imam al-Nawi rahimullah said, that there's a veil, a barrier between people and hellfire. And if all you pursued were your desires with no boundaries, the boundaries that Allah sets, if you pursue your desires and you abandon the boundaries of Allah, you're pursuing that path to hellfire. So you might think, no, this is only desire. Shaytan makes it look good. He makes it look good. It's just desire. It's not a big deal. What's the big deal? One life, right? He makes you curious about a sin or about bad companionship, about drugs, about smoking weed about vaping. And it's something that he makes you think it's not a big deal. And as the devil tricks people into these small steps, it's just an innocent relationship. We're just flirting. It's not a big deal. The people find themselves months or years later somewhere they never imagined they would be. That path of desires with no boundaries from Allah leads to the hellfire. And we ask Allah to protect us. And the path to Jannah requires some effort. But here's the beautiful thing about these hardships as they're defined. As Sufyan al-Thawri rahmullah said, attributed to him at least, that he worked on his nafs for 20 years to force it to pray Qiyamul Layl. And he got to enjoy Qiyamul Layl for the next 20 years. Meaning what? Eventually, when you master your nafs, yourself, and it reaches a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is at a high level, then you start to enjoy and taste the sweetness of all acts of worship. You start to look forward to pleasing Allah and it's no longer just about entering Jannah. It's about pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And nafsul mutma'inna. You're always seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. So these hardships don't become hardships. Those five prayers, you don't think this is a burden. No, this is a prescription, a sweet, beautiful prescription for my soul. Every prayer that we pray is a prescription for the soul. We fall down in between these prayers and the next prayer brings you back up. If you're giving the prayer, it's right. Somebody says, but I don't benefit from salah, I don't feel anything. Give more to the salah and you will get more out of it. If you're rushing salah, how do you expect to enjoy it? 
If you're rushing the prayer, how do you expect the salah to give you sweetness? Take your time with prayer. It's the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask about. These hardships that we go through, we put our effort towards, they are keys to unlocking Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the highest levels of Jannah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, there is no one amongst you who does not have two positions, one in Jannah and one in Hellfire. The believer will have a house built for them in Jannah and the house in Hellfire will be demolished. What does this mean? Think about how frightening this hadith is. That at this moment there is a house in Jannah for you and a house in Hellfire as well. And the one who makes it to Jannah, the house in Hellfire is demolished. And the, those who do not make it to Jannah, their places in Jannah are also demolished. Why? Because they don't deserve and earn a share of Jannah. A share that you inherit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the people of Jannah, الوارثون, And in another ayah in Surah Al-A'raf, uh, you inherited. Urithtumuha with what? Bima kuntum ta'malun. I want you to think about what this means. Why does Allah use the word inheritance in the Quran? You're inheriting Jannah, why? An inheritance is something you deserve, something you earned. You have it, it's yours. And it will be given at a certain time or certain place. There's a share for you when you inherit something from a parent or a member of the family who's deceased. And Jannah is given as an inheritance to the believers because of their actions. That you worked for. Bima kuntum ta'malun. Our actions are a means of unlocking and earning more of the share of Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the highest levels of Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in the Quran, and I'm going to ask you a question about this. The concept of the quality of Jannah. Surah An-Nisa, ayah 77. قُلْ مَتَاعُ الدُّنْيَا قَلِيلٌ Say, in, indeed, the enjoyment of this life, قليل, it's very little. The quality is, is, is minuscule, it's nothing. And the hereafter, Jannah, is better for people who have taqwa. It's better for those who have God consciousness. It's eternal in reward. So I want to ask you this question. And I usually ask this and I really enjoy hearing some answers. And if you can maybe raise your hand and give us an answer to this question. What are some experiences that you enjoy in this life? What are some things you enjoy doing in this world? Anything. By reading Quran. MashaAllah, reading Quran, okay. Memorizing Quran. Spending time with family. Okay, spending time with family, excellent. What else? Dhikr. Dhikr, excellent. It doesn't have to only be a ritual, by the way. Anything, any enjoyment of this world. Taking the prayer time from Sunday to every prayer time that makes that happen. MashaAllah, JazakAllah khairan. So thinking about the next prayer time from each prayer time. In the back, Sulaiman. Video games. As long as they're halal, good. Alhamdulillah, no problem. Yes. Pokemon. Pokemon. MashaAllah. May Allah grant you the Pokemon of Jannah. Yes. Okay, over there. Studying. MashaAllah. That's great. I've never, I've asked this question maybe for 10 years. I've never heard someone say studying. I think that's amazing. I hope you do well in school. May Allah grant you success. Say Ameen. Amen. What else? Yes? MashaAllah. Studying Quran. Okay, we got studying already crossed off. Let's get something else. InshaAllah. When you see your family stick to that deen. What is it? When you see your family stick to that deen. When you see your family stick to the deen. Excellent. JazakAllah khairan. Okay, athletics. What kind of sports do you like? Basketball, excellent. MashaAllah, excellent. What else? What are some things you enjoy in this world? And I'm going to tell you why I'm asking this question, inshaAllah. Yes? MashaAllah, okay, yes? Thank you, JazakAllah khaira. What a sweet answer. I don't have any candy to throw out, but thank you for the sweet answer. He said, listening to you, MashaAllah. What, what are some other answers? Yes? Excellent, JazakAllah khaira. Exploring nature. Exploring nature. Excellent. What else? Has anyone here done um, parasailing? Anyone? Parasailing? Yes? Coming to the masjid. Coming to the masjid. Excellent. JazakAllah khaira. Yes? Memorizing Quran. Quran. Excellent. JazakAllah khaira. What else? Nice. Scuba diving. I was going to ask scuba diving next. How many people here have been scuba diving? MashaAllah. Excellent. MashaAllah. One day. How many people here have been skydiving? Yeah? MashaAllah. One person only in the entire masjid? <laughs> Two people. I've also been, I'm doing a skydiving license. I want to share with you a personal story. And I'll tell you why I'm asking you this question. The first time I went skydiving, I know it's crazy, 
The first time I went skydiving, and it's actually very safe. As we're climbing up in the airplane, there's a person that we, we brought with us, a friend. We, we haven't heard him say any kind of dhikr in a long time. And as we're climbing up, you're looking out the window and you're starting to rethink your decision to jump out of a plane. And you're paying someone to do it. And they teach you everything in advance. It's a three hour class, uh, advanced free fall I believe. And as you're going to jump, they have two instructors. They're not tied to you, they're jumping next to you. You can have somebody tied to you if you want. That's the beginner's course. So what happens? We're going up in the air and he's like, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Like, oh my God, he's making shahada. We go up, they open the window, you jump out, your instructor's on the right and left. And as you jump out, you have to do certain things. They're, they're holding on to you, right? You have to do certain things to show them you're not panicking. You have an altimeter, so it shows the altitude of where you are, 14,000 feet. You fall, every five seconds you fall 1,000 feet, okay? So it's very fast paced, you can't panic. And you have to pull your, you have to show them you can pull your parachute. Three times you reach for your parachute. So as you're in the air, you pass whatever test they tell you to pass in advance. You know, you're calm, you can show them that you're okay. And then what happens at 5,000 feet, you wave off. This means I'm gonna pull my parachute, I'm done. Okay, 5,000 feet, I pull the parachute, I'm on my own. Now what happens when you're on your own? You've gone skydiving. What happens when you're, when you're finally pulling the chute? Especially if it's a nice uh, natural scenic uh, view. You're looking out at the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one of the most tranquil and peaceful moments. It's one of the most beautiful things in the world. I know it sounds crazy, but it's beautiful. You're looking out at the creation of Allah, you're making dhikr, you're reciting Quran, you probably said the shahada 100,000 times. And as you get closer to landing, maybe a few more times. But the reason I mention this in the next example as well, is that the enjoyment is always limited in quality and quantity. There's no comparison at all between any enjoyment you have in this life and Jannah. I ask this question many times and I hear so, so many different kinds of answers. A lot of parents say their favorite thing in this world is a nap without interruptions. That's, that's a parent's answer. Uninter uninterrupted naps. Somebody said food. That's great, alhamdulillah, no problem. The second example, how many people have been to any of the uh, Caribbean islands? Anyone? A few people? I was, I was in one of the islands about seven or eight years ago, Dominican Republic, and the entire country is a coast. And I decided one day, I was there for a program, I decided I was the only Muslim in the group, so I decided I would go and pray Fajr on the coast. It was a 10 minute walk to the beach. And I wanted to see the sun rise, I wanted to just hang out, there was nothing to do. So I went by myself, and as I finished Fajr and the sun is rising, I want to describe to you this moment, and this is why I chose this background of a beach. I want to describe to you this one moment that felt perfect, I never felt anything like it. When the sun started to rise, the weather was perfect. It was not cold or hot, there wasn't any kind of uh, breeze, it was just perfect. I can't describe it except with the word perfect. The beach was a white sand beach with no rocks, no garbage, no shells, no litter. It was pure sand. The palm trees were right above the recliner I was sitting on. I couldn't see any human being all the way down to the right, all the way down to the left. And you can hear the birds chirping, making dhikr in the background. The water was every shade of aquatic colors, turquoise, blue, clear, like in the wallpaper. It looked like it was otherworldly, especially if you're like me coming from Michigan where it's cold half the year. For me, it was the perfect moment. And I think it was seven or eight years ago, so I took out one of the older phones, one of the very first smartphones, and I tried to take a video and a picture. And I looked and I said, this is not what I'm experiencing, this is not how I feel. It's a picture, but it's not the same thing. And then I got sad, and I thought this moment's gonna end very quickly. And how many moments are there like this in, in this world? We enjoy things, yes, alhamdulillah, and we should as long as they're permissible. But they are very fleeting in quantity and quality. Don't forget, if you're seeking Jannah, the place of those who are God conscious, don't let this life and the desires of this world that are prohibited distract you and cost you an eternal life. Because that is, as Imam Ibn Qayyim said, that is a type of foolishness. For you to give up Jannah for eternity because of one hour of disobeying Allah in this world, it's foolishness. Why? Because this moment, this life, in the next world, when we look back, we're gonna think it was very quick. Can you imagine standing on the day of judgment? It's an eternal life and you think of this world and it was like a sa'a, it was like an hour, very quick glimpse, a very quick memory. You ask a, a loved one on their deathbed, 
Give me a description of your life. And in a few moments, they tell you the summaries and the highlights of their life. This is what my life was about. I went there, I did this, I did that. And now I'm here. It was a very quick memory. Don't let this life distract you from the eternal bliss of the hereafter. The Prophet ﷺ said, The space of the bow of any one of you in Jannah is better than everything that the sun rises upon in this world. The space of a bow, a small space in Jannah. Can you imagine? It's better than every single thing that the sun rises upon in this world. The Prophet ﷺ teaches us that the two rak'ahs before Fajr prayer, it's better than everything in this world. And in one report, everything that the sun rises upon. The two rak'ahs before Fajr, these are a nafila. The Prophet ﷺ never abandoned them even when he was traveling. What about Fajr prayer itself? The Prophet ﷺ describes Fajr and Isha in the masjid and how difficult it is for the hypocrites to make it to the masjid. And that if they knew the reward that there was in the jama'ah, at that time, they would come to the masjid even if they had to crawl. I want to ask you a question, and I want you to answer very honestly. Very honestly. If someone told us tonight, that tomorrow morning, tomorrow Sunday, right? Tomorrow morning, Sunday morning, whoever prays Fajr in jama'ah, you will have guaranteed, instantly, you will have one billion dollars put into your accounts. How many of us would be praying here in Jama'ah? All of us, right? Let's be very honest. Can we get a show of hands? How many people would come here for a billion dollars? Alhamdulillah. Now, of course, we're coming for Fajr, but there's also a billion dollars. I want to ask you one more question. What if you were told, same offer, but you have to walk to the masjid? You can't use your car or any other kind of vehicle. You have to walk. How many people will still come here for a billion dollars? Yes, all of us. No doubts. No doubt whatsoever. What if somebody told you, you had to crawl to the masjid? I will still come here. For a billion dollars, you crawl one morning and you have a billion dollars. Wouldn't we still be here? Now that's just money, that's a billion. I think some of us would do it for a hundred thousand, maybe a thousand, right? If we're willing to crawl for something we can see, where is our faith in what Allah describes as a reward for the things we cannot see? The reward is so great that people would crawl for it. The Prophet ﷺ is telling us words that we have to take into consideration. What would people crawl for? If it's not greater than billions of dollars. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst the people of consistent sincere actions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the highest levels of Jannah. Amongst the rewards of Jannah is reuniting with your loved ones. Imagine entering Jannah. Jannah to Ali Yatkhulunaha. Waman salaha min abaim wa azwajim wa duriyatihim. Wal malaika to yatkhuluna alayhim in kuli bab. Salamun alaykum bima sabartum fa ni'ma uhbadda. Can you imagine? As you find your palace in Jannah, you reunite with your family. You have a gathering. And this gathering is the most beautiful gathering. And you are talking about this world. Do you remember when we used to go to the masjid together? Do you remember when we used to read Quran together? Do you remember when we did such and such together? People in Jannah will have some memories, according to many of the ayats of the Quran, of the things that took place in this world. Positive, happy memories. Nothing that is distressful or negative. Can you imagine... You get to your palace and then you feel somebody tapping on your shoulder. You turn around and then you see a parent who passed away before you. May Allah have mercy on them. You turn around, you find your spouse who passed away before you. You turn around, you find your children or their offspring. You turn around and you find a friend. You guys were close in this world but you became distant over time. You turn around and you find somebody that you loved and looked up to. You turn around and you see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You turn around and you see Prophet Musa alayhi salam. The strong Prophet Musa alayhi salam, the one who one punch kill. You turn around, you find Prophet Dawood alayhi salam. Yalhamukullah. You turn around, you find Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, given half the world's beauty. Imagine you turn around, you see Jibreel alayhi salam. Or the angels of the weather, the angels of the snow. You guys don't get snow here, right? The angels of the rain, right? Over Seattle. You turn around, you find all of these angels. And you're thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing you to make it to paradise. Can you imagine if you turn around and you find the Prophet ﷺ smiling at you? That you've done well, you followed his sunnah ﷺ, you worked hard for Jannah. And oftentimes when we talk about the family reunion, people really don't appreciate what this means. And sometimes people, you know, they make jokes. Like a, a wife one time, she heard that she's like, wait, my husband's going to be in Jannah? I thought, I thought this was Jannah. And her husband once said the same thing. No, work on your marriage, you'll make it to Jannah inshaAllah. But ultimately, it doesn't matter who you turn around and see. You're going to appreciate that you made it to paradise. 
Nobody in Jannah says, I wish I didn't work hard for it. Nobody says it wasn't worth it. And that's what we have to keep in mind. Why? Jannah as a concept, as a subject, as a topic is an intersection in this life, right now, today, in this world, an intersection between multiple fields, multiple subjects. Amongst them is what? Amongst them is psychology, overcoming hardship, philosophy, talking about eternal reward and how it's worth going through hardship. Another of the rewards is what? Theology, accepting it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all the highest levels of Jannah. And of course, because we're in the masjid, we have to make this announcement. Whoever has a black Honda, License plate ending in 1243. Please move your vehicle so that you may make it to Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you Jannah. If you have a black Honda, please move your vehicle. It starts with BL and it ends with 1243. Jazakumullah khairan. So I want you to imagine for a moment that as people are gathering, they are also realizing that some people did not make it there. Some people did not make it to paradise. And they will ask one another. They will go upon one another and start to talk and ask questions. And they will even ask the people of hellfire. There are some conversations with the people of hellfire. ما سلككم في سقر What caused you to go to hell? How did you end up there? قالوا لم نكن من المصلين We did not used to pray. ولم نكن نطعم المسكين We did not used to feed those who needed to be fed. وكنا نخوض مع القائضين وكنا نكذب بيوم الدين We used to reject that there's life after death. حتى أتانا يقين until they reached that certainty, the reality, the reality that there is life after death. Every day of our lives, my brothers and sisters, when we wake up, we have to reflect, this might be my last day. When we go to sleep, before you close your eyes, this might be my last night. Have I used this last day for the sake of Allah? And if not, let me ask Allah for forgiveness. Am I using tomorrow, this next day, for the sake of Allah? Am I working for a final destination? Our final destination is not one we can forget about. When we forget, we go back to the Qur'an, we connect on a daily basis, we, we make dua for it all the time. Allah min yas'aluka al-jannah three times a day, seven times a day, as per the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. And Jannah makes dua on your behalf. Oh Allah, the servant prayed for Jannah, so allow them to enter Jannah. And you make dua, Allahumma ajirni min al-nar, three times or seven times a day. And hellfire makes dua for you. Oh Allah, this person sought, sought protection in you from me, so protect them from the hellfire. And when you make this dua, don't just make the dua and move on. Think about what it means. My actions right now, my work, my time, my efforts, my laziness. When you feel lazy, think of Jannah. For some people, maybe you have to think of hellfire. But think of something that motivates you to take action. Jannah is a home of eternal bliss. And when we think about it, it makes everything in this life look like a prison. That is why the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, الدنيا سجن المؤمن وجنة الكافر That this life is like a prison for the believer. And a uh, Jannah for the disbeliever. Meaning what? Meaning that what Allah has uh, in store, prepared for you in the next life, is so great that this life looks a, like a prison. And what there is of punishment for those who reject the truth and they will be held accountable for it, those who are held accountable for it, that next life and that punishment is so severe that it makes everything in this world, no matter how bad it is in this life, it makes it look like a Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the Jannah of this life and the Jannah of the next life. The Jannah of this life, as we said in the beginning, is the tranquility of the heart. The tranquility of the heart that you are connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want you to imagine as people settle down in Jannah, a voice calls out, Ya Ahl al-Jannah, O people of Jannah, your Lord, tabaraka wa ta'ala, the exalted and praised, wants to meet with you, wants to give you something. Fahayyu ala ziyarati. So come and meet your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they will all gather. And as they gather, they are told, This is Yawm al Mazid, this is the day of giving more. As we said before, Lahum ma yasha'una fiha. وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيدٍ لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا الْحُسْنَ وَزِيَادَةٍ And more. So you're already going to get Jannah beyond your imagination. But there's more. There's Mazid. There's Ziyadah. What is this? The Prophet ﷺ describes it. And there are many authentic ahadith that Ziyadah or Mazid refers to seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the highest levels of Jannah and allow us to see Him on that day. When the people of Jannah are in Jannah, it's mentioned, and I'm going through this as uh, I'm paraphrasing through this, that everyone will be sitting, and as they're sitting, they will imagine that they're in the best of places. Nobody looks at somebody else and says, you have a better place than me. Everyone is happy in Jannah with what they have. There are no ill feelings. There are no grudges in Jannah. May Allah purify our hearts in this world before we get to Jannah and they're purified on that day. And so as they're gathering here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the people of Jannah, ask of me. And they say, Ya Allah, we seek for you to be pleased with us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if I were not pleased with you, I would not have allowed you to enter Jannah. 
And you are honored. Meaning on top of that, you are given an honor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, he says, ask of me. This is all translation and paraphrasing. They will say together, Ya Allah, we ask for your good pleasure. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask them to testify that he is pleased with them. And then he subhanahu wa ta'ala will say once more, ask of me. And they will ask of Allah until each and every one of them is completed asking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he will grant them that which no eye has seen. مَا لَا عَيْنُ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُذُنُ سَمِعَتْ Which no ear has heard and which has not been conceived by any human heart in this world. The greatest reward in the next life is meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah grant us that. And the greatest punishment in the next life is not having known Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it requires us to work for it. It requires us to strive. It won't always be easy, but the reward is worth it. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He says in Surah Al-A'raf, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِم مِّنْ غِلْ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهِمُ الْأَنْهَارِ That we remove from their hearts, we purify their hearts from anything that is evil. No grudges, no ill feelings towards each other. You're not going to enter Jannah and you say, my brother, you backbit me, I, I don't feel like we're even. So everything of ill grudges, jealousy, envy, anything at all that you held in your hearts, it's purified. Why does Allah mention that the people's hearts will be purified and then right away, for those of you who know the ayah, you know that you don't stop in the qira'ah there, you don't stop in the recitation. Tajri min tahtihimul anhar comes with the first part. وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِ مِنْ غِلٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهِمُ الْأَنْهَارِ They're connected. Why? Why does Allah mention the rivers of Jannah after He mentions that the hearts of the people of Jannah are purified? I want you to think about the hadith, the authentic report from Abdullah ibn, um, uh, ibn Amr ibn Al-As radiallahu anhumah and the old man who entered the, jannah, who entered the masjid and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said this is a man of Jannah. Three days in a row until he went. This is reported from Anas bin Malik radiallahu anh. And Abdullah ibn Amr went to the man's house and he stayed with him for three days and three nights. He looked for something. What's this man doing for the Prophet to say he's a man of Jannah? The man doesn't even know. Because on the last day, Abdullah tells him why he stayed. I'm summarizing. And as he's leaving the man's home, the man has no idea why. And then he says, wait, there's one thing. And in one of the reports of Muslim, he says, I empty my heart out of any ill grudges towards my brothers and sisters. Meaning I empty my heart out from anything of uh, ill vices. Purify your heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that the people of Jannah, their hearts will be purified. And they will earn as a reward the rivers of Jannah, a place in Jannah. And water in general and the rivers of Jannah are, are, are a reminder of purification. Purify your heart in this world so that you are purifying a place for yourself in Jannah. Purify your heart in this world so that you are earning the purity of Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala empty all of our hearts from any ill grudges towards one another. My brothers and sisters, we should never study the subject of Jannah and then leave that gathering and still have something in our hearts towards one another. We should not talk or reflect on Jannah or recite about Jannah and then leave that gathering or that moment or that place and you are still cutting off a relative or a brother or a sister. We ask Allah to protect us from that. Be the first to reach out, even if it means you have to move your ego to the side. The purification of the hearts in this world, as we saw from the hadith, is a means for us to get to Jannah. And the effort, the effort is worth it. لَهُمْ مَا يَشَاءُونَ فِيهَا وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيدٍ May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of us the highest levels of Jannah and forgive us for all of our shortcomings. May Allah make us better in private than what other people see in public. What are some very practical things we can stop with? Uh, number one, the foundation of uh, belief, the foundation of submission to Allah is to believe in His oneness and to act upon it. This is why in the Quran, Amanu wa Amilu Salihat, as a phrase, they are combined more than 50 times in the Quran. Because if you say, I believe in Allah, then your actions better prove that. If you say, I'm a believer, but in my heart, I have a good heart, I don't have actions, your Iman is not just in your heart, it has to manifest through some kind of action. So Iman is in the heart, on the tongue, through dhikr and remembrance and so on and so forth. La ilaha illallah. And in one's actions. The second, if the only thing you take from tonight is that you implement a daily habit of tawbah, then that will be sufficient. Because the one who repents to Allah on a daily basis is safe. Because we all fall short. But once you stop repenting to Allah regularly, then you should worry. And this is why subhanAllah, the people who pray... And they follow the sunnah of prayer, which is what? The athkar after salah. The athkar of dua. Athkar of sabahi wal masa. You're always asking Allah for forgiveness. Sayyid al-istighfar. Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa ant. 
When you're always doing these things, you're always asking Allah for forgiveness. Make it a regular habit. Don't ever lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, connect with the Qur'an on a daily basis. I think every one of us will agree that there is a reciter or recitation of the Qur'an that moves us when we listen to it. Right? There's a particular clip when you listen to it or a reciter in general. When you listen to that reciter, it moves you in your heart. I want you to think about this blessing that we have. Before the 19th or before the 20th century, people did not have the blessing of recordings of the Qur'an that we have today. And this is an additional way for us to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's speech. Because if you find a recitation that moves you, I hope by Allah that you have access to it very quickly. I hope that it's downloaded onto your phone. Some people, mashallah, they have everything downloaded on their phones except the Qur'an app. Why? If the Qur'an is a priority, then have quick access to it. Don't let there be many steps between you and something that increases your iman. The recitations that move you, have quick access to them. Some days you might listen to the Qur'an and you did not realize how, how impactful an ayah is until you heard it on that day. And if you listen and recite and review throughout the days and nights, the Qur'an will absolutely be a cure, a shifa, and a rahmah for all of our problems. Number four, put your full trust in Allah. Don't worry so much about the future in this life that you're not taking any action or you're stressing out or you're becoming anxious. Work for it, but put your trust in Allah. You don't know what the future holds. Allah is planning good for you. But put your trust in Allah. He will provide for you as He provides for the birds. They leave their nest in the morning hungry, looking for food, and they come back at dusk with a full belly. Put your trust in Allah. Allah will suffice you. He will take care of you. Number five, anything happens in this world, accept your decree. When something strikes of calamity, whether it's something bad or something you perceive to be bad, you say, When you're content with the decree of Allah, you're always optimistic. My Jannah is in my heart wherever I go. As Ibn Taymiyyah said, meaning what? You're accepting of your Qadr wherever you are. This is the highest level of Iman. For us to reach this level of contentment with everything that happens. When something good happens for the believer, you say Alhamdulillah. When something of calamity strikes, you're, you're patient, sabr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us through the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa so it's something good for you as well. It's always good for the believer. Number six, our character with each other, with Muslims, non-Muslims, old and young, has to be like the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in principle, meaning what? وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We follow the rahmah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with your loved ones, with your family, with your friends, with your relatives, with your neighbors, with the people in the organizations that fight with one another and they split over organizations. Have mercy towards one another. If a woman, a prostitute was forgiven because she gave water to a dog, what about mercy towards a human being? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us merciful to one another. Treat people the way you want Allah to treat you. Be merciful to people if you want Allah to be merciful to you. Forgive others if you want Allah to forgive you. Don't you wish for Allah to forgive you? Pardon and forgive others. And number seven, my dear brothers and sisters, the objective of reaching the pleasure of Allah and the reward of Jannah requires perseverance. Never give up and never stop. Never stop asking of Allah, never lose hope in Allah. يَا ابْنَ آدَمْ إِنَّكَ مَا دَعَوْتَنِي وَرَجَوْتَنِي غَفَرْتُ لَكَ عَلَى مَا كَانَ مِنْكَ وَلَا أُبَالِي As Allah says in the hadith Qudsi of Tirmidhi O son of Adam, O children of Adam, as long as you call upon me, have hope in me. As long as you call upon Allah and you have hope in Him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. And He does not mind, meaning He wants to forgive you. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all the highest levels of Jannah. Allahumma ghfir al-mu'minina wal-mu'minat, wal-muslimina wal-muslimat, al-ahya'i minhum wal-amwat. Allahumma ghfir li-walidina wa li-walidi walidina. Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulubi wal-absar, thabbit qulubana ala dinik. Allahumma rzuqna husna al-khatima, waj'al khayra ayyamina yawman al-qaq. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-firdaws al-a'la. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-firdaws al-a'la. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-firdaws al-a'la. Allahumma ajirna min al-nar. Allahumma ajirna min al-nar. Allahumma ajirna من النار ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصل لهم على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وجزاكم الله خيرا.
Jazakallah khair. The question is about the gates of Jannah. Are there any traditions that mention the names of the gates? Some of the scholars, based on some of the hadith, uh, like the, the gate of salah, the gate of jihad, the gate of fasting, these are mentioned authentic hadith. The gate of people who enter bilhayd al hisab uh, is mentioned also as the right hand gate of Jannah. So there are some scholars who try to theorize about the last one or two based on, the, based on their understanding of whether or not a hadith was weak or uh, strong. But most of the gates of Jannah are mentioned in different traditions. Wallahu alam. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakum Allah khair.